Oh, you got your, you got your t-shirt on, even. You are ready to rumble this time. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to say good morning and uh, good evening to Bonita, the beautiful Bonita Capuano, who is on the other side of the world in Australia. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Fayez Mukarem. I am the Lebanese ambassador for One Small Town, which is this incredible movement that is going on around the world. It is. It's so amazing. And it's really just taken off in the last few months, hasn't it? It's gone from like a, you know, a, a movement, but it's just skyrocketed. We need to send a lot of love to the founder, Michael Tillinger, who is yes. a South African uh, uh, scientist and geologist and writer who started the movement called Ubuntu, which is I am because we are unity within community. From that, the school of One Small Town was born, which is an economic model based on collaboration, co-ownership, uh, working with Mother Nature, and being able to thrive as an economy. We have successfully activated the One Small Towns in more than 40 uh, uh, countries. We have more than 40 ambassadors. And right now, it's actually thriving in villages like Ras al -Matin, One Small Town Ras al -Matin, which is a beautiful village in Lebanon. And there's three other villages that are following where we are reminding people how much abundance there is in this beautiful world. Amazing. So good. I love that this is all coming. Why do you think now is the time? Why do you think it's now that it's it's really taking off, like more people are coming along for the, the journey? So knowledge is power. And uh, uh, there's no longer coherency when we see that uh, we are being pushed into a world of separation and fear and scarcity and then we realize but wait a second why are people dying from hunger when we can just you know throw seeds in the ground uh, and plant food i mean for people who don't know how the farming process works one potato that just needs a little bit of sand and a little bit of fertilizer and fertilizer isn't this like crazy scientific chemical that we need to import from you know uh, mit or something it's uh, manure you can just use manure uh, cow manure and anything like that. Once you put that potato in the ground, you get seven back within three months. So the best business or partner to be in is uh, mother nature and farming. And again, this isn't about growing tomatoes and apples. You can literally grow anything you think you need from food to medicine. I gave an example in our last interview that hemp was used by uh, Henry Ford, who owned yeah. the Ford company, to actually create a car made from hemp, a truck. And he powered the truck from hemp oil. For those who don't understand how generators work, when they started the whole generator industry, it was never about crude oil or petrol. It was literally about vegetable oil and peanut oil to power those generators. Hence, you, you, know, you understand that there's something called biofuel going on, where we use corn, uh, where we use algae okay, as a biofuel. So when we realize that there's an agenda being pushed, and then we know that there's a solution, and we're all coming together uh, as one uh, soul, one mind, uh, sharing information, we realize that there is a solution to our situation. And again, we're not here to fight anyone. Uh, we're here to create an alternative system, and we have already won. We know the game. Uh, it's a game of chess. We are at checkmate. Excited to see what happens as this unfolds for one small town and more places just pop up around the world. I actually want to talk about the concept of one small town, how it relates to education and the, you know the kids about how they're gonna what schooling's gonna look like in the future what's one small town's philosophies around school or education for kids so we have a lot of slogans um, that we have created over the years um, one of them is we are using the tools of enslavement as tools of liberation which is why okay. you know we're all for money and uh, supplying our villages with excess money and the abundance for them to thrive until they get to a situation where, you know, why do we need money if, you know, we have a Lamborghini factory and all the food I need is here. And if I want a Louis Vuitton handbag, you know, I'll, I'll just get it imported. Um, other slogans are things like money does nothing. People do everything. And then my favorite is education, not indoctrination. And uh, I'm actually an expert when it comes to what's going on in the education business for several reasons. One of them is I actually come from a family that owns schools. Uh, we have a successful school in England, in London, called the International School of London. Uh, we also have another one in Qatar, the thriving, beautiful economy of Qatar, 
where the World Cup just uh, took place. Um, and both schools uh, are very famous in two distinct things. One is called the IB program, which is a program offered to children or students before they go to university. And then the other thing is forest school, which is a very important uh, thing. I actually studied in that school in London from the age of eight till uh, 18 or 17. And now my daughter, Thea, who's a four-year-old, also studies in that school. Now, what's amazing about the forest school is that it allows you to work with mother nature, to do self-assessment, uh, uh, risk assessment, uh, to engage in you know, the natural world. Uh, so these programs are important and they have been successful. So implementing new programs isn't a very complicated thing. And uh, once it does work, you know, it can easily be copied uh, around the world. So to me, education is something that we can have access to. And I uh, uh, personally have been a teacher in my life. I've taught a language. I've taught a subject like quantum physics at one point when I was in South America. Uh, for those who don't know my background, I've studied management, I've studied aviation, private piloting, I've studied quantum physics, I'm a professional chef, uh, I love mother nature, and I've been investing for the last seven years in alternative energy, electricity, and everything to do with the health world. Um, I don't watch TV, I don't follow sports, I don't have any uh, you know, nasty habits. All I do is engage in learning and trying to be the best father uh, to my four-year-old. And uh, best husband. So the education is a very important department because it's our perception of who we are, where we are, what we are, what we're supposed to be doing. And unfortunately, there has been an agenda to compartmentalize and to departmentalize the human race where you are a lawyer or you are an accountant or you are a chef or you are uh, a teacher. Okay, or an engineer, or you know, you're gonna play sports. Why not be someone that can uh, engage in all of these subjects and empower yourself? I mean, if I'm going to have someone work with me as a doctor, what do you think is is gonna be a better person? A doctor who's only studied medicine, or a doctor who's been a chef in his life, or a doctor who's been a chef and a psych uh, psychology major in his life? Okay, what we do is we add value to ourselves. And we realize that we are capable of learning so much more than they have taught us. I mean, you have geniuses like Nikola Tesla, okay, uh, who has actually invented uh, more than 500 uh, different uh, technologies, think, of which yeah. 320 are patented. Things like AC, alternative uh, current, things like robotics, uh, radio, were all given by, by Nikola Tesla, induction motor that Elon Musk uses now uh, in his company called Tesla. The point is Tesla, Nikola Tesla spoke over seven languages, over seven languages. How was that possible? Was he some genius in a, in a crazy way? No, he's a human being that allowed his uh, organs to take advantage of uh, his surroundings, okay? And he was always at the right uh, uh, frequency and vibration instead of you know, being put in a world of let's watch cartoons all day, and let's eat sugar all day and uh, you're going to do what you, you know, you're told. So we believe that education uh, is something that we should take back for several reasons. One, the human race or the students deserve to know about uh, information that they don't know about. Second, we're about to change the world that they live in. So this idea that I'm going to go to school, primary, then secondary, then I'm going to get a degree, then I'll do my internship then I'll probably get a job, then I'll start making money, then I should you know, uh, rent a house or an apartment, then try and get married, okay. then get a mortgage. The whole process um, will be eliminated because you will start your life in a world of abundance where your food, your electricity, your internet, your school, your health center, uh, a clothes factory, toys factory are all available for you. You are the owner of these products and these companies. You will be receiving goods and services. You will be receiving dividends, money, okay? And you have access to the whole world. Because again, one small town is not about isolation. We are not here to isolate ourselves in some village and, you know, grow tomatoes. We are about abundance. We are about technologies. We are about using robots and AI technology. But most importantly, we are about integrating the 195 countries around the world to work uh, as brothers and sisters and share their technology. So this new paradigm shift that's taking place, and it's not something we wanna do, we're doing, 
okay, and it's uh, uh, being played out in Rasulmatan, requires uh, a specific interference, especially in the education, because all of a sudden, you know, you've changed what they know of reality, uh, which is why it's a very important uh, subject. I want to just say a quote that I had just sent you, and I would like to repeat it at the end. And this is one of my favorite quotes. And it is, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot unlearn the many lies that they have been conditioned to believe and seek out the hidden knowledge that they have been conditioned to reject. An example is a relative of mine, I'm not gonna name her, but she has a PhD. We talk science, we talk facts. When she asks about evidence, I give her the evidence from uh, you know, PhD doctors or engineers, and then she can't even get herself to look at the evidence, okay? There's uh, a programming that has taken place. And you know, if that, pro if that information doesn't come from a specific peer reviewed journal or her direct boss or professor gives her the green light to read it, she no longer can. And we see things like this taking place in religion. And we see things like this taking place in the world of mobs and mafias. Well, it's, it's evident now that, that that quote is on point because who we thought was smart um, has turned out not to be smart. That academia smart, where you're using your brain, that's what, you know, the old school mentality of that's what smart is. But then they're, they're not the ones that know what's going on and aren't able to evolve. They've stopped their evolution when they they went through the system and then stopped their evolution of growing. This is a part of uh, an agenda, a pyramid of information. I always give an example of the Manhattan Project that took place in New York uh, and other, I think also Canada, where there was 100,000 people involved in creating, uh, at that time, a nuclear bomb. Now, only nine people out of the 100,000 knew what they were doing. And I have very close friends in the military. Uh, some of our ambassadors are very high up in the military. And you know, we have so much information on how uh, the compartmentalization actually takes place. And nobody knows what the other person is doing. And when you have situations like that, you can literally take over and control information, especially in very important fields. Fields like science, fields like health. Uh, education, our history, okay? I mean, uh, anyone that knows science uh, or information in technology and uh, physics should be a student of people like Faraday, like uh, Maxwell, like Charles Steinmetz, like Nikola Tesla. When you start talking about people like Einstein, and that's more into theoretical physics. That's something that cannot be uh, touched. It's just, you know, stories and information on the board. Um, and that is something we should always be very careful of. The same thing in the world of health. I don't want to go into the world of, you know, COVID and conspiracies with you and stuff like that, but it was very obvious what happened. Forget about Fayez or, or Bonita. Let's talk about people like Dolores Cahill, who has a PhD in immunology, a virology expert who has patents in her name. She came up with information and she was censored. Since when is, is there censorship in science? Um, so these are very delicate situations. And then, you know, you look at down the rabbit hole and then you realize that companies like Pfizer have paid $7 billion in lawsuits, in lawsuits because in a court of law, there was evidence to prove that there was foul play. And these are the times that they were caught. Uh, so this is information that we really need to dissect. And when we talk about uh, uh, knowledge, it needs to be always uh, uh, proven, experimentally, uh, observably, repeatably. And, uh, and, and the last example of COVID is, uh, Kerry Mollis, who is a Nobel Prize winner, who invented the PCR test, told the whole world that this PCR test cannot be used to detect diseases. You know what I mean? Who, was, uh, who, who died four months before the whole COVID uh, took place. So in our world of one small town, we're not going to allow some email to instruct me or to give me information or to uh, uh, wait for the New World uh, Orders, United Nations or World Health Organization to tell me, you know, what to do or what's up. I'm supposed to follow. I want to see it for myself. I want to look at the electron microscope. I want to see the PCR tests. Okay. I want to do the scanning. Okay. I know that quantum physics uh, is beautiful. So let's explore it. Okay. I want to take the kids and invite them to understand, you know, what this air is, the oxygen and the nitrogen, 
how the soil works, what the sun really is, the beautiful portal that's giving us carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, what our bodies are capable of doing, okay? Why natural immunity is so much, uh, you know, better than injecting yourself or living, you know, uh, next to a, a pharmacy. Uh, so this is all information that we need to give. Most importantly, our children, our students need to learn to be happy. Okay, horses are happy. You don't find a horse that's depressed one day or upset because the other horse, you know, spoke about him or, or his self-esteem drops or there's uh, abuse on that level that we are, the mental abuse, okay? And especially in the first seven years, there's a Masonic saying that says, give us your kids for the first seven years and then do what you please with them because that's when all the programming takes place. So if we get them young and what's amazing about our education uh, model that we are implementing in Lebanon as a blueprint so that it can be uh, replicated around the world is that we're creating a curriculum. When does education start for a child? When do you think it starts? When do they get sent to school? They get sent to school when they're five. So education starts when the mother is pregnant. Of That's course. when it starts. Of course. I'm okay. saying when, they, when do they do it yeah. here? Yeah. Well, even even yeah. preconception, isn't it? It's the preconception about how the mother's body is before she even tries to conceive and the health and all of that is huge. And even actually when going the, to that day is we, I have this conversation about even um, parents being more consciously making the decision to have children versus having them because that's what we do. I, I think there's a big piece that we can educate adults of why are you choosing to have a child? Do you plan on being around for that child versus putting it into a school, you know, and getting taken care of by a school? So there's a lot of free stuff. Would you agree? I always joke about two things. I mean, I, I once went to a wedding with my wife in Lebanon. We were here on a summer holiday. So they are the owners of Pepsi. I should maybe uh, of Nigeria. The point is a couple of million dollars uh, spent on that wedding. Six months later, the couple divorced, okay? Um, we should allow couples to live together for a couple of years. If they maintain that amazing relationship, they should throw that amazing wedding. When it comes to children, I think we should really understand the importance, the responsibility, the gratitude of having a child. Maybe we should start giving licenses. Obviously, one small town will, will move all of that away because uh, once the unit is restored, a mother understands this amazing blessing I mean, I said in our last interview that a woman is superior to a man because a woman is a stargate bringing souls from different realms, okay? You are superior in your compassion, in your intuition, in your clairvoyance, this capacity you have to, to, to raise a child while the man, uh, you know, can offer so many uh, other things. is very important. So yes, the education is important, not only to the children, but to the entire community, to the parents, to the mother, to the father. Again, when the unit is not broken, Everything changes. Uh, what's happening these days is the mother and the father have to work. Both of them are leaving the house. Okay. The woman started working, which was amazing uh, for the uh, new world order because they started receiving a lot of tax. They were able to separate the parents. They were able to access the kids. Okay. Cause more corruption. So there's a lot of uh, motives behind that. I'm all for men and women, you know, being completely equal. But when it comes to that period of raising a child, that three, four years, five years, I mean, I don't want to get very personal into my relationship with my wife and my daughter, but my, my daughter spent years breastfeeding. Uh, and that is a world of magic on its own. You're getting all the immunity, all the antibodies. There's a, a computer program going on where the milk transforms and changes based on the necessity of what the child needs. Um, so this bonding is very important. Instead of, you know, within a couple of months, no more breastfeeding, now we're gonna give her cow milk, okay? Which has protein, however, it's nothing compared to what a mother's milk does, especially with the programming that doesn't take place. Hence why you have a lot of autism, you have a lot of allergies, uh, you have a lot of, uh, you know, hormonal issues going on. So this world will be uh, activated where the parents will be restored uh, to owning their lands, to having their food. I mean, this idea of the hunter and gatherer where I used to go for, for hours to hunt, I think that was all nonsense because they probably just had the cow tied okay, on the corner and, you know, once every couple of months they would slaughter the male cow okay, or the male sheep. And that was it. And they had beautiful trees around themselves and they had plants, okay, and they probably had uh, water. 
okay, boreholes. Uh, so education is going to be very important to the parents and to the children, especially in this new structure that uh, that we are creating. It's like the prisoners. Once they leave jail, a lot of them commit suicide because they don't know how to react with society. They don't know how to embrace this change. They don't know how to take responsibility. They don't know how to be alone. Uh, and this is all part of the system. A reminder that our beautiful America, which has a $22, $23 trillion economy, is not an amazing America anymore. When one in every three is obese, when half of the population are diabetic, when 20 veterans in the United States Army are committing suicide daily, when a thousand kids are being kidnapped daily, half of them come back, half of them are taken to islands, whatever it is, things are, are not looking so good. Millions are you know, in some sort of correctional phase. Uh, unemployment is, is over the roof. Uh, we need to restore love. We need to restore unity. And one small town know how to do this. Remember, while I'm talking to you, I'm on more than 50 groups. I'm connected to every country in the world. Okay, I'm getting information like they're getting information from me. Okay, so this is power. I love this. I'm so excited for this new world. I'm so excited. How does um, one small town? How, can you just walk me through a bit of an overview of what this? Is it, is it a school? Is it because my vision is that the family and the community take precipice over the child's um, experiences and there's more experiences for the kids versus a curriculum and having to learn a subject. So how does one small town see children um, being nurtured? So again, um, Michael Tillinger always says that sound has light and light has a sound. Yeah. Um, it's very important to maintain the right uh, vibration, okay, in the school, and it has to have a steady frequency. Now, remember, not all children are the same. There is no such thing as one size fits all. This has to be an experience where they're growing. I love the idea that, you know, a child is looking at a cobra, and then you start talking about the skin quality, the biology of the cobra. You can give a little bit of maths about the cobra, a history about the cobra. So you're in, uh, uh, you're embracing the love that the child has for something specific, and you're allowing different uh, topics and subjects uh, to be explored. Um, are we going to have a physical, tangible infrastructure for the school? Definitely. Is it going to be theoretical and bored? Negative. We will allow the child to experience a fire where they will get a hose and put the fire off with the water. Okay. Uh, while they're wearing, you know, the right uniforms. And then end of the, the experience, after, you know, he's full of excitement and positive energy, we will discuss the thermodynamics and pressures and the type of water that was used and why it was important to use that specific uh, uniform, the helmet, the distance. So we will, uh, first of all, allow them to enjoy what they are doing. We will make the experience an unforgettable one. And then we will engage in the theoretical part Okay, so that it is part of their program. And that was the topic of the day, fire and how to deal with fire. And this is how we will be dealing with all the different subjects. Now, we will be creating sets, just like a movie set. Okay, so if there are, you know, learning about biology or acidity, why not, you know, uh, show them the real acidity that exists in their mouths or on their bodies and how it, uh, it connects uh, to a specific uh, organ like a meat and then how it, it breaks it up and decomposes it, example. So it's all going to be a fun journey where they will be uh, constantly in a fun fair. They will be in like a, a, an amazing movie set where they will have all sorts of toys and they will be required to learn about all these toys. At a very young age, you can give them a plastic knife and you know allow them to, to cut uh, fake carrots. But by the time they're five and they're six, they should be cutting the carrot perfectly. Example. Uh, I always give an example of uh, my sister's children who are in the you know American system in Lebanon uh, learning versus uh, and their ages from eight till till, till twenty versus uh, the local goat herder okay who works with us who has his uh, daughter who's five years old. That five year old knows so much more than my uh, sister's kids because she's constantly learning from her dad. She's working with you know animals and nature and electricity and diesel and cars. And, you know, she even knows how to ride a, a bike, a motorbike. Uh, so it is very important for our children to be engaged constantly. And that requires a couple of important points. One of them is the type of set we have. 
Second, the methodology in which we teach. In your in our uh, previous interview, you asked me about how am I attracting the right people. Imagine in Rasulmatan, which is the village we're in right now, which where one small town is taking place, a lady contacted me, and it turns out that this lady, who is self-taught, who has three degrees in, in education, created a methodology that's been peer-reviewed in the Middle Eastern journal called Hadatha, and she found a methodology in which she can access the, the mind, distract the front cortex, and allow kids to learn languages and subjects in an amazing way. And she connects that to their happiness and uh, to the frequency they're on. And she even has small gadgets that she puts in the classroom to do with light and to music. Uh, so we're changing the methodology in which we teach kids. We're changing the curriculum. We're changing the sets. Okay. And again, uh, school isn't something that should ever finish. I mean, all of us should be learning constantly. The day you stop learning is the day, you know, uh, you, you shouldn't Sorry. exist anymore because... Remember, we live in a holofractographic universe where there's always information. There's an input and an output going on. Uh, there's a toroidal uh, 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 energy going on. So we're supposed to be learning and giving. So these kids will learn. Now, in our world, in our curriculum, we see that by the age of nine, our children will have their BS by the, uh, or Bachelor of Science. By the time they're 11, 12, 13, they could easily have a couple of PhDs. By the time they're 14, that's it. You know, they've learned about all the technologies, all the knowledge, understanding the power of breath, farming, how to use a sword, uh, how to build a radio, how to be a carpenter, a plumber, okay, musician, singing, sports, what this construct is, and most importantly, how to work in collaboration and uh, uh, co-ownership, okay, in cooperation with their fellow brothers and sisters, and how amazing this uh, uh, structure is that we live in. And in order to get there, you need to break a lot of the programming that has been taking place. How many times have you heard that there's going to be a war over water? Uh -huh. How many times have you heard there's going to be a war over oil? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Over everything. There's a war over everything. But, but there's oh, abundance of oil. There's, I love it. there's abundance of water. Yeah. So we need to um, change the information. Tell me, because um, you're mentioning PhDs and kind of, do you still feel us we're going to go that direction? Like we're going to need a, a, a certificate or a certification? I get these questions all the time from parents I'm speaking to about, you know, we're going to a place where it's all experience. You don't need to necessarily pass tests or have these. Do you, do you still see us using these um, PhDs and kind of things to be certified? It's basically the level you are on, the growth. So it's like when you're playing, you know, Super Mario or Nintendo, it takes you into different levels. Uh, what level are you on? Okay. What level are you on? And again, because you're exploring so many different subjects, uh, you don't have to, you know, be on all the top levels immediately. This could be a process of five years, 10 years, 15 years. So we're actually uh, uh, exploring that because the way we see it is we're not only changing the education on a primary level, but we're going to change it on a secondary level. We have an amazing team, by the way, of 15 uh, intellectuals, all part of the education team of Lebanon. Some are in the States, some are in England, uh, some are in uh, uh, parts of Asia, and most of them are here in Lebanon, where we're working on developing this curriculum. Because once we, we get it achieved, we want to implement it and you know, transform what schools around the world are actually teaching and how they're teaching. I love it. I'm all in. I'm. This is what I want to create too. So this is. Ah, uh, it sounds so good when you, when you hear it, and we're all coming together. Because it's almost flipping the script, isn't it? The way that it's done now with the the schooling system, and that people think it's weird to look after your own children and to let them experience life. What do you say to those parents that are kind of sitting on the fence, going, "I know school's not great, and I don't really want to send my child, but I'm still going to send them. How can we move into this new world? Like, what do you say to the parents that are sitting on the fence? Um, homeschooling is a scientific fact that kids are much more smarter, okay? And they're happier to an extent. Now, again, you can't have homeschooling going on while there is, you know, sexual abuse or drug abuse or alcoholic abuse or constant distress. Uh, uh, so, everything, so, you know, there's no such thing as, as a one model. Um, the idea that we send our kids to school is not only about education, but for them to have a social life, to enjoy themselves, and to give ourselves time to do other things. Now, we really need to understand the importance of being there for our children. I mean, 
The average age is supposed to be anywhere between eight to 100. We obviously live much more than that if we really take care of ourselves. But you know, you're only required to give 10% of that or 15% of that time to your children. So engage in them and enjoy them and embrace them. Now, there isn't, it's not only about a comparison where, okay, our new education system is gonna be much better or the current education system uh, you know, should be better than homeschooling because of the social benefits. It's about putting our kids in danger. So right now, if you have your children in public schooling, most of us know that there's also an agenda that's uh, created where they are constantly being separated. You know, the whole masks thing, uh, the whole medical interventions that are being forced on us, uh, the sexual question that's being played out. Okay, I'm all for freedom and independence and diversity, but don't force children on specific subjects and allow this uh, conversation to take place naturally without hormone intervention and medical intervention and all that stuff. Uh, so it's actually a danger to keep your kids right now in the public school. And uh, now obviously each country has its uh, different uh, criteria and different laws. Uh, you know, London, England uh, is, you know, uh, to me ahead of the world in terms of history and technology. Uh, why do our laws completely differ than those from Australia and Canada? Uh, why did the whole COVID nonsense, you know, uh, shut down immediately uh, or the laws? So we need to really understand, are we putting our children in a danger? If we are, get those kids out of public schools, put them in a private one or put them in homeschooling until one small town starts in a village close or near to you and allows your children to participate in this incredible new change that we're doing. So do you think, so my understanding is it doesn't matter if it's private school or public school, they're the same. It's the same. Do you differentiate between the private and the public? In my case, yes. Um, again, because, you know, we know what's going on in our private school in, in London. Uh, we know who the teachers are, what their program is. Uh, we're very uh, strict in specific policies. My wife, remember, is a doctor. She's also a, a, a holistic nutritionist. Uh, she's part of the UK Medical Freedom Alliance of England that have fought the government in a court of law and proven, you know, all the science. She's very, very tough and she's a super mom. So she's uh, always in contact with the school and the board and, you know, sending emails and making sure nobody's messing with our daughter. I think it's much more easier to do that in a private school versus a, a government public one uh, that, you know, uh, has a much different uh, or, or wider range of students and usually a bigger agenda. And it's much more difficult to access the, the teachers versus a, a private one. Now, again, you really need to just, you know, supervise what's going on, understand the, you know, uh, the different uh, scenarios that could take place. I mean, it's like, you know, when you talk about being healthy, uh, what is health? You know, it's a huge topic. You could be eating healthy, but, you know, you're using the wrong detergents for your clothes or you're constantly around specific paint that's toxicating your body or maybe stress is destroying you or a specific uh, tea that you're putting sugar in every day. So it's a very, very big topic. So preventing uh, problems or situations for our children is something you should get involved in and you should understand what the world we are living in is and be able to you know, make sure you supply uh, the best uh, life your children deserve to be in. Beautiful. And so being an ad, I want to talk about that, actually. Look, uh, what are you and your wife doing to be an advocate for your child? Like now that your child is in school, what kind of things can parents do if they if they have chosen or they are sending their kids to school at the moment? What would some tips you would give to be there for your child? Like have conversations with the teachers. What are you suggesting? Uh, first of all, you need to have conversations with your child. Uh you know, a four-year-old, I, I found out at a very, uh, when my daughter was just, you know, five months old or even less, that, you know, she's actually communicating all the time. There was a doctor on Oprah Winfrey that spoke about the different cries. Um, so I always took her as an adult that's trying to express themselves, but didn't have the memory or understanding or, on how to use her mouth or her, her hands and all that stuff. I never took her as this person that, you know, that doesn't have a brain. Uh, it's important for your child, first of all, to understand the difference between, you know, eating unnecessary uh, bread uh, to, you know, the wrong sugars, to, uh, uh, to not taking care of her body, to uh, engaging in the wrong exercise or putting herself in danger. 
Okay, it's important for her to to uh, to understand as much as you can train her in understanding what's right and what's wrong. Now, in terms of the school, it's not some you know Alcatraz jail uh, that's miles away. Uh, it's you know it's it's your local school. You're supposed to know about the infrastructure, know about the teachers. What's the curriculum? What are the classes? What is she being taught? Is that healthy for her? Is are they using the right methodology? Is it safe? Is it secure? Are there any complexes being created? Are there any unnecessary programming taking place? Is she being bullied? Okay, does it smell right? Uh, are they allowing her to rest, to relax? Are they communicating with you if you know she's in distress or she's in pain or she just fell? Okay, are they respecting the menu that you've given to, for your daughter? I mean, my wife has you know had done a terrific job in not introducing sugar to my daughter. Uh, she tries to use alternative uh, at all times, even stuff like gluten glue to the power of 10. Uh, uh, so she tries as much as possible to engage with her teachers. And if they're going to give a cake, she, you know, she gives them the flour and she tells them, please use this specific brand of flour and use it for all the students. So she tries to interfere as much as she can in that way. And, you know, these days it's much easier because there's WhatsApp groups. Uh, there's more, you know, communication going on. Uh, they, there's Zoom meetings that are taking place. There's reports. We're constantly being given you know, pictures of our daughter's daily activities, at least one day, yes, one day, no, or every other day. Uh, so you need to you know, make it happen, get involved, especially in the first seven years of your child's uh, education. Because after that, it becomes very difficult after the program has been implemented. Mm -hmm. Yes, and even the health, the first seven years for your gut health are so important on building that microbiome and having all of that beautiful so reduce the chances of any diseases and illnesses and because your gut speaks to your mind and the mental illnesses you know you know all the stuff you know all the stuff so yes. so important that seven years is so important definitely okay. and especially yeah. epigenetics you know biology of belief is real mm -hmm. bruce lipton he has a phd in cell biology uh, proves yeah. it scientifically and he always talks about stuff like the honeymoon effect when you're happy you know how your health uh, improves yeah. Uh, so we need to take all that into consideration. Again, we live in a world of collaboration, cooperation. Uh, uh, this idea of competition exists in specific breeds or animals, but it doesn't represent Mother Nature. As I had told you before, Susan Simmert, a PhD in forestology, explains how trees speak, how they communicate, how they help each other. And I've read a, a nice book called uh, The Secret Life of Plants, where a CIA expert puts lie detectors uh, uh, on uh, on plants, and they end up, you know, that they all have extra sensory perceptions. They recognize when somebody's hitting them or abusing them. Uh, so we all have to go back to communicating. And uh, I like the saying that says, uh, "The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men uh, to do nothing." Something like that. We need to step up. We need to interfere. Okay, and we need to take back uh, our rights. Now, how are we going to do that if we're working 50-hour jobs trying to pay rent or pay electricity or pay our insurance? This is all part of the, uh, the programming and the evil agenda that has us completely occupied. And any time we literally have, we're spending it on our, you know, trying to get our dopamine levels back by watching TikTok, uh, short reels, or, or WhatsApp, or, sorry, yeah. or, or uh, Facebook or, or YouTube. And most of us who have businesses or are working in businesses actually need to use social media. And we're constantly checking what was posted. So this is all a distraction that's taking place. 100%. So what, what do you say then for while we're waiting for, not waiting, but what, what do we do? What are people, normal, everyday people um, that are part of this uh, wanting to create a better world? What is one or two things you would suggest that they do to help us as a collective consciousness move towards that new world? What can we do for the kids, like specifically the kids, I guess? What can parents do? Okay, first of all, do not approach your child when you are on a negative vibe, okay, or negative frequency. Make sure you start by loving yourself, by appreciating yourself, by loving this incredible construct that we are in, by understanding that we've already won. One small town is here. We are the ones that we have been waiting for. Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, God, uh, chi, prana, nobody's coming for you. It's you. You are the one that's going to take uh, the right decisions, okay? Energy in motion, your emotions, your thoughts, okay? We are going to be taking the right steps into creating this real world that we deserve to live in, and it's happening. So you've already won. 
Now, what you need to do is be patient, love yourself, okay? Approach your child, be there for your child, hug your child, love your child, okay? And understand that they need parents to give them love, to appreciate them, not to judge them, okay? And make sure their temple is clean, okay? Now try, you know, putting uh, uh, so, some uh, chocolate sugar in your engine of a car, okay? I assure you it will, it will stop. Uh, get away from medications, anything that's addictive, okay? Do whatever you feel is right, but uh, conservatively, okay? Do not abuse that part. Allow love to take place at home, okay? Allow dialogue, okay? And remember to keep your child uh, in a vibration of happiness. I always uh, uh, remind people that there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. Uh, until you can actually get out of this world where you're, you know, constantly spending time on uh, a survival mode instead of a thriving mode. So be there for your children. Love your children. Talk to your children. Okay. Take time with your children. You know, if he's playing with the aunt, sit down, watch that aunt, laugh, ask questions about that aunt, uh, answer questions that he has about that aunt. Okay. Anything can be fun. Uh, remember, children are being programmed. So it's up to you to either uh, embrace this world and explain that this is a world of love or fear. It's your direction. And get rid of the, the phones and the laptops and the computers and all that stuff. Minimize their engagement in it. Okay, and make it a point for them to understand that school is about fun. Don't, you know, uh, you know, some of us have teenagers that are 10 or 14 years old and we're constantly stressing them and, you know, expecting the perfect grade. Uh, chill, relax. Okay, most of the, the most successful people in the world, you know, didn't even finish uh, university. The owner of KFC started the whole KFC empire when he was 65 years old. So don't judge your, your children in any way. Allow them to be themselves. Beautiful, Fayez. Good. There's still some, um, what we got to do as individuals before we can pass that on to our kids. Remember, we already have, uh, we already have an ambassador in uh, Australia and he's, uh, he's doing a terrific job. Okay. And, uh, I love him with all my heart. And uh, most importantly, uh, one small town is being activated, as I said, all around the world. So expect this change to come sooner than you think to a town near you. And with the power of the online world, uh, we're going to be able to su uh, supply uh, this information online in terms of courses, in terms of curriculums, in terms of certifications, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and please contact us. You know, we're not some uh, United Nations world where, you know, we have secretaries and we get back to you with emails or automated responses. We are human beings. We are the brothers and sisters. We are your tribe. So just call us and contact us. Uh, on our website, onesmalltown.org, you will see a list of all the ambassadors. And on that, you will find uh, Mark, uh, Mr. Mark Burden, who is an amazing man, who is from Australia. I don't know if it's Adelaide or Sydney. And you can contact him and get involved. And, you know, you can become a patriot. Uh, you can uh, purchase our one small tokens again, which is our community token backed by sweat equity, backed by our tangible assets and investments that we're doing. This is real money. And you can uh, support us in that way because the funds are going to be distributed uh, to all the offices around the world and then to all the different investments that we're doing. And obviously, we know what you need. We know that the human being needs clean air, water, food. Uh, you know, uh, preventive medicine, education, uh, uh, houses. Uh, so we, we, we are going to be supplying all our villages with the basic essentials. And most importantly, we are sharing our inventories. So even if, you know, uh, Adelaide doesn't produce honey, we will be, you know, exporting honey to Adelaide. Although, you know, uh, anything can be farmed. Yeah, it's going back to creating it yourself instead of trying to get it from somewhere else. So much fun in being a beekeeper. Oh. Such a beautiful world. Yeah, I'm excited about creating well, this whole new world for these kids because the school system right now is just like, it's it's so hard to watch. Like now that we we understand what's going on and we've been through it, it's just, oh, to just see them just losing their spark and their spirit, those schools are set up to just completely disseminate them. Again, it's very difficult, you know. Uh, I can talk all I want about me and my family, but 80% of, you know, specific family members are completely programmed, uh, completely brainwashed. And this is why we're going to end the, the conversation re repeating the quote. 
whenever you feel like. I still have a lot of time. Uh, and they are the illiterate ones. So we really need to take our time in breaking you know, that rock and then remolding it. Okay, other, and it's very important. Yeah, go ahead. I, c I completely agree. Um, what I'm seeing is with my conversations and, you know, being part of trying to move them, even the ones that are doing the first five years at home with their kids, right? So there's a, a large percentage of parents that are staying home with their kids. They're not sending them to childcare because they don't want to immunize them. They're staying at home with them. But then when it comes to school age, like when they're five or six, they end up sending them to school. Because what I think I've come to conclusion is when it, when it comes down to it, there is still a need for the materialism stuff. So they still want the career, they still want the money, and they're like, well, I don't want to look after my kid all the time. What do you see with that gap? What's your, what's your take on that? Are you seeing that too? Like, you know, you see 80% are still not having that thought process. I'm seeing that too. What's Remember, th th there's definitely a left brain and a right brain going on. A lot of those, you know, the illiterate of the 21st century have lost a lot of compassion and love. And there's, you know, for them, there is no other way. We need to address it completely. Again, I can't tell you that you're independent and you're going to be self-sustainable and uh, force you to still uh, get medicine from, you know, the World Health Organization. Independence means independence. So these children really need to see the amazing development and the progress and the big advantage of this new economy or new village or new setup that we have created, uh, which is why we're taking everything in consideration. I mean, part of what we're doing, an amazing movement right now in Russell Matten, one small town, is the creative world where we're inviting musicians and actors and singers. Uh, you know, in our academy, which is sponsored by the sale of our beautiful NFTs and our gallery, we're teaching robotics and we're teaching blockchain technology and beekeeping and everything because kids need to be happy. Adults need to be happy. Um, in terms of let them look after themselves, definitely. But that's the idea of independence, that a child realizes that I can access food from my farm, that I can access clothes, that I can access toys, that I can travel around the world now that I'm part of this one small town community. Now, when you're giving those parents this alternative system, why would they ever push them or force their children to go back to school or, you know, or universities that we know of. Um, so I think that, you know, that's the answer. Now, in the meantime, um, this, this isn't for everybody. I mean, to actually get to a point where you can say that, you know, I'm an earthling, okay, and I have England in my heart and Nigeria and Venezuela and New York and Lebanon, and I see all the continents as, you know, my brothers. It's not, not everyone can say that. I, 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 you know, 25 years ago, I was living in ego, not in eco. It was about me, 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 not we, we, we. So I went through my natural process of growing and, you know, being enlightened. Uh, and I always give the example of Greg Braden, where he says that you need to go from being someone to no one to everyone. Okay. So it's a natural process. Now, parents or, or humans in general, they like to, you know, be given different options and they like to be shown the way. And this is what one small town is going to be about. Once you see the, the superiority of being in this alternative system, no one's going to say no. Uh, no one's going to resist it or reject it. On the contrary, it will be embraced, okay? And uh, uh, we're not going to have an issue there. Okay. All right. So is that, it, it, it's really that they don't feel like they can step away from work because of, they don't feel like they can sustain a, a lifestyle that they really want because they're not supported in all the different facets that life involves. And one small town will Ex counter that. Yes, correct. Exactly. Plus, plus, give the opportunity, you know, to travel around the world. I mean, for me to actually stay right now in a village and, you know, engage. And yesterday I was in a farm for, or before yesterday, for four hours alone, taking measurements. Because I'm so at peace. I'm so relaxed. I've, I've lived New York. I've lived Miami. I've, you know, uh, lived London. I've been Europe. I lived Africa. I lived South I've experienced life. Like now I'm so grounded, okay? Now, when you're young, you don't have that grounding, okay? Because you still want to travel and you still want to engage. Um, my niece just went to New York and came back. She came back as a different person, just a much happier person. So we want our, our One Small Town members to travel all around the world. And now that we have, you know, villages all around the world, it's going to be so easy in terms of traveling, the tourism, the costs, the experience, the love, okay? They're always going to be constantly pumped. And they're going to be learning languages and cultures and most importantly, allowing themselves to remain on a frequency of uh, love, which is the best, most important language of all. Of course, of course.
I just hope it is the majority. When you said like you can't see everyone doing it, I'm like, no, everyone has to live this way. It's the only way we're going to be able to sustain. That's how I see the new world. It's we'll all be living this way. There'll be a, there'll be no other way left. Look, all of us want to be happy. All of us want to be at peace. Okay, at least ninety percent of it. Now, eighty percent don't know that there's an alternative system. They don't know about the way. So it's our job to make it happen and then to market it. Okay, we want the Kim Kardashian reality show uh, showing how our lives have changed, and that's what's going to happen. And then you know the domino effect will take place, and everybody will you know join. Now, who will be resisting the the zero point one percent? They're not even the one percent who are the top of the the pyramid, who will res- resist and will reject and will try to fight. Which is why we don't want to fight them. Okay, we forgive them, we love them, we understand that they you know that they were in a gridlock, they suffered, they're part of this evil agenda, okay? We, we're just going to ignore them and create this uh, new system, alternative system. Uh, but there will be a little bit of resistance, okay? We need to forgive. And we need to be the bigger, you know, father or brother or mother and see them as, you know, a bunch of kids. Not all of them are have their brains uh, and move forward. Bring it on, I say. I am ready. I'm ready. I think this is going to be a continuous conversation. We'll definitely have uh, more interviews and hopefully you will also be interviewing other ambassadors at some point. We've won. Okay. Get involved with one small town, participate, help where you can understand that you are part of this incredible universe. There's no reason to be uh, upset or sad uh, or fearful. Okay. The quote is, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, okay? But those who cannot unlearn the many lies that they have been conditioned to believe and seek out the hidden knowledge that they have been conditioned to reject, okay? So beware of those, okay? And start learning and start unlearning. And again, I thank you for your beautiful work. I thank uh, all the One Small Town members the ambassadors follow us on our Facebook pages. Okay. Uh, one small town, Lebanon, one small town, UK, one small town, Canada, one small town, Australia, and, uh, uh go to our website, one small and, uh, be the change you wish to see in this world. Oh, yes. Thank you for bringing all of this into our vision, into our reality. Cause it's people like you that are really making this happen and just living it now. We can't wait for anything. Like you said, we're not waiting for anything. You're just doing it and making it happen. And it's we need more people like that doing that. So thank you for doing that and giving us and showing us the way and showing people the way and what they can do and giving us hope and faith. And I'm just so excited. The cake's being baked. So take your time. Enjoy it because you're about to eat something delicious. And remember when you're planting, it's all about the intention. But that seeds cover it and allow the beautiful sun and the rainwater to do its magic okay be present my brothers and sisters love to all for anyone that has questions you can always email me on lebanon lebanon at one small town.org okay lebanon at one small town.org one thing in my last interview i i i ended it with the yellow chakra it's not the yellow chakra it's the red one okay the base one which is the uh, i am Okay, so I am that I am. Love how you're just fixing that up. Great, thank you. Thanks, Fayez.